Oh, maybe I can actually see some of the people in the chat. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's such a it's such a pleasure to speak to this group. You know, uh, I, I was telling Karen that it was a couple of years ago that um, I was uh, in the north of Denmark um, uh, for the summer workshop, which was a, a wonderful uh, chance to interact with uh, um, the folks at DTU and, and now with the power of Zoom, a number of others as well. So um, the story I'll tell today, um, by the way, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Just want to make sure. Is that okay? Karen, can you chime in if everything, everyone can see my screen? Yes, we can see it, so I'm guessing everyone else can. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so the story I'm going to tell today is, is really about um, something I, I normally, you know, to, to, to the uh, um, uh, people in, in the number of people in this audience, I usually speak about our CO2 reduction work, um, which is uh, great and would, would love to, you know, give a talk about that too, but I wanted to spend this time actually talking about a different subject matter um, uh, that our group works on. Actually, the, the larger area of our group, some people may not know our CO2 reduction work in our group's a bit of a side project. Um, I, uh, one of the uh, certainly more expansive areas of our group is in this uh, really kind of long-term question that we've been asking, uh, which is how to build um, molecularly precise uh, catalysts on uh, um, surfaces, on, 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 on heterogeneous surfaces, on particularly electrode surfaces, um, in a way that gives us um, a very high degree of molecular precision and tunability. Uh, and this is really with the, you know, sort of long-term aim of being not only able to pull apart molecular level structure function correlations um, at, a, at a very precise level, but, but also uh, being able to sort of design a three-dimensional surface active sites that can uh, perform um, uh, very unexpected and unusual catalytic transformations uh, with, with hopefully the ability to break uh, um, uh, uh, scaling relationships. Okay, so if I can click, let me get my laser pointer. Okay, so um, I'm gonna frame this a little bit by kind of asking, you know, what really is a single atom catalyst, right? So, so there's been kind of, uh, there's been very, um, I would say hot area in catalysis, and I think for a lot of good reasons, there's there's a lot of interest in in the notion of being able to embed a single active site, a site isolated active site within um, the matrix of the band structure of a solid, and then sort of asking what is its catalytic behavior. And and the way I'm going to sort of frame this is by by viewing what the heterogeneous catalysis community views as single atom catalysts and contrasting that from uh, what a molecular chemist would view as a catalyst. And I actually think there's a lot of commonality in these two ways of thinking. So, so um, uh, to kind of begin this discussion, if you look at say a, a molecular active site, and I'm, I'm choosing um, uh, for, for a very specific reason, say a porphyrin compound, right? Uh, an active site that may exist in, in an enzymatic pocket. Um, this consists of a metal site ligated by four nitrogen atoms uh, within the aromatic framework of a discrete uh, macrocyclic ligand framework. Um, and, you know, we can know very, very um, uh, kind of analogously that one can view, although this is a very loose analogy, of course, because the local structure uh, is very different, um, uh, but even more than that, the electronic structure of the solid is very different. But one can identify at least uh, the same core binding motif for, say, iron in a prototypical metal and doped carbon material, which is certainly one class of single atom catalysts that have received a great deal of attention in the context of electrochemical energy conversion. And we can sort of ask, what are the similarities and differences between these? Well, at some level, I can certainly describe the local environment around this iron site with ligating units that have chemical familiarity with these, although one can already see that the parolic ligation environment here is different than the, the putative pyridinic ligation that exists within the metal NC framework. And we've actually, um, uh, we have a paper in review right now, it's on Chem Archive, where we actually make from the bottom up a synthetic model compound that mirrors this pyridinic ligation environment. But that won't really be the focus of this talk so much as to really pull further out and really ask what are the differences between these two. Well, in addition to the question of the local environment, which one can synthetically modify on the molecule, there's a very big difference in electronic structure, right? Of course, here the metal site has a, a, a localized projected density of states which resides within a continuum of electronic states provided by the band structure of the solid. And of course, in contrast here, we have uh, discrete energy levels in the molecular fragment that have generally fairly large energy separations. 
Now, the power of molecular systems, and this is indeed uh, the, the sort of uh, bedrock of, of uh, you know, now I would say over a century of molecular catalysis work, has been the ability to systematically manipulate the local and non-local environment of these active sites, their three-dimensional structure, their steric profile, which has really led to sort of impressive control over molecular level reactivity. And, and I would argue that to a great extent, um, our, our ability to do that at single atom catalysts that are authentically embedded within the band structure of a solid are, are far more limited. Um, and, and that's largely because of the way in which many of these materials are synthesized. Uh, but of course, uh, because these single atom catalysts reside within a continuum of electronic states, we're able to expose new types of a particularly electrochemical reactivity that would not exist here. And that, that's really the focus of, of this talk, is really trying to explain what are the differences in these reactivities and how can we make materials that really bridge these two in a systematic way. Uh, both at a synthetic level and at an understanding level. So, so in, in my view, the perfect single atom catalyst would be one that had molecularly precise, tunable, local active site environments that were sort of arbitrarily controllable at the three-dimensional level by bottom-up molecular level synthesis, but would also display band-like electronic structure akin to that of an authentic single atom catalyst, if you will, embedded within, say, a graphene sheet or an endo carbon. Um, and, and I would say that prior to our work, there was really no way to do this. But what, what the body of work I'm going to show you today, I think, offers enormous opportunity for actually achieving this. So um, that's really where I see this, is sort of molecular and single atom catalysts straddling this divide, right? And, and the reason we were really interested in this area is, is, is as many of you know, um, in the single atom catalysis community, at least for N-doped carbon materials, which is really an old field before this was called single atom catalyst, these were called metal N-doped carbons. And it dates well into the, the 1970s and 80s, where people discovered, uh, particularly in the context of oxygen reduction catalysis, that um, uh, pyrolysis of N-doped uh, or, or metal macrocycles that was at the time um, with carbons would lead to improvements in their overall electrochemical activity. And, and uh, this has, of course, been sort of rebranded in the current vernacular as single atom catalyst, but this is a pretty old field. And it's a pretty old field that's recognized over the decades uh, that um, uh, most all preparations of single atom catalysts that are endoped carbons, because of the temperature of their preparation, usually in excess of, of 700 degrees C, um, lead generally to a distribution of active site environments. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that, in, in our mind, um, uh, gives us uh, some, some challenges with understanding how these systems behave. And um, to a great extent, if you're doing synthesis by sort of the random stochastic rearrangement of carbons at 800 degrees C, your ability to control things at an atomically precise level is, is, is very limited, right? And so th this has really been a long-standing challenge for I'd say over 40 years um, and it, it has not really been um, uh, really effectively addressed. Um, and, and I would say that it, it, there are other things that make the study of single atom catalysts challenging, right? Um, um, and, and I'm drawing this in the context of using balls just to represent active sites. So this would even apply for, say, a single atom catalyst that might reside on a metal surface. Um, I, I, you know, to the extent that there's heterogeneity in the environments, identity of the local active sites is challenging. Um, um, as many of you know, many of these materials are prone to restructuring, and I would say that's even true to a great extent for some single atom catalysts that are endoped carbons, depending upon the conditions of the reaction, um, uh, particularly under aggressive oxidative conditions. Um, and then I would say from a spectroscopic level, it is difficult in a single atom catalyst to be able to hone in and identify spectroscopic features or, or um, sort of signatures that can be benchmarked to theory or other things, uh, usually because there's a pretty significant convolution from the background of the bulk signal of the material or other sites that are not the active sites um, on that material. And then the last piece, which I find really intriguing and, and very uh, instructive, at least for, you know, see that as, as I talk about this more, is that for most single atom catalysts, it is hard to reproduce in a molecular structure the local environment with high enough fidelity. And, and that makes it difficult um, uh, to be able to extract and use the toolkit of molecular chemistry to understand at an atomistic level what is going on in the system and to correlate thermochemical and kinetic properties.
So this was our grand goal. This was sort of an enterprise we began about four years ago, um, uh, which was to really ask um, how can we try to meld these two different worlds of the molecular and the heterogeneous single atom catalysis world. And one of the reasons we were particularly intrigued with this is, is by digging into the details of how molecules and heterogeneous solids carry out electrocatalytic reactions in different ways from a mechanistic standpoint. And I wanna describe that on the slide, right? So there's a rich community, um, many, many researchers that study molecular electrocatalysis. And this is very distinct from heterogeneous, I call inner sphere electrocatalysis for the reasons I'll describe. So in molecular catalysis, what you essentially have is a discrete active site usually diffuses to the electrode surface that is otherwise inert to the catalytic reaction. There's an electron that tunnels across the double layer to that molecule, and then in a separate step, a substrate interacts with that site. That substrate just denoted as S could be, say, CO2 or proton or, or, or O2, for example. And then subsequent electron transfer steps that are individually separated lead ultimately to the final product. Key point here is that electron transfer and substrate activation or reactant activation are, are, are sort of inherently stepwise by virtue of this tunneling barrier imposed between the two. And, and as I don't need to describe to this audience, right, um, in the situation where you have a, a substrate interacting with, say, a metallic active site, you don't have this sort of um, non-adiabatic electron transfer and then substrate activation. You really have adiabatic uh, processes where substrate binding is coincident with electron reorganization, right? Um, and, and uh, um, you know, this group certainly has computed in great detail kind of the consequences of this. Uh, but of course, these sites are, are not tunable at the level that we would be able to have for these molecules, right? So, um, and you cannot, in, in, in our mind, you know, cross this divide by simply tethering a molecule to a surface, particularly if that tether presents a tunneling barrier between the active sites, between the metallic solid and the molecular active site, right? Because the electronic structure of this site has not been fundamentally altered, or put another way, the electronic interaction between this metal site that's doing the chemistry and the rest of the band states of the solid is relatively negligible. And so as a result of this, what prevails here is a molecular type of a redox-mediated catalysis rather than the inner sphere adiabatic type of catalysis that we observe on a metallic surface site. So our hypothesis going into this was to ask whether we could take a molecular site we could build from the bottom up, attach it to a metallic surface in such a way that would engender a high enough degree of electronic interaction for these sites to display catalytic reactivity akin to this of a metallic surface while having the bottom up tunability that is akin to that of a molecular, molecular species. Right? And to the best of our knowledge, no one's been able to do this uh, before. So um, like most cool things in science, we got started by working on something slightly different. Uh, but Tomo and my group, um, now an assistant professor in Japan, um, started off by asking, what is the substrate on which we could do this coupling of a molecule with a band in a high fidelity fashion that would engender a high degree of interaction? And, and we turned to graphitic carbon materials, which um, not only present sort of an inert background on which to do molecular functionalization, um, but they also provide a rich uh, surface chemistry which, which, with which to address, right? And so these are consistent. Uh, pretty much every graphitic carbon has, uh, of course, graphene sheets that are terminated by step edges and edge planes. And a lot of work before we did, um, you know, um, uh, Rich McCreary, many others um, uh, in the electrochemistry and surface science community have identified that the edges of these carbon materials are composed of oxidic functional groups. Things like ketones, phenols, carboxylic acids, orthoquinones, lactones, paraquinones, to a first approximation, these uh, oxidic functional groups comprise uh, the vast majority of functional groups on the edges of virtually any graphitic carbon material, whether it be a carbon black or a glassy carbon electron or a high surface area, even end dope carbon, will always display these sorts of sites on their edges, right? Uh, and so um, following on some, some of the pioneering work from Richard Compton's group, um, uh, we wanted to do a very simple uh, 1890s organic chemistry reaction where we take an aromatic 1,2-diamine compound and we do a double condensation with this orthoquinone moiety to generate, very importantly, an aromatic pyrazine linkage, right? Um, you can then analyze this pyrazine linkage by XPS and you see a nitrogen 1S resonance that's associated with these nitrogen sites that are in the pyridinic ligation environment. For those of you who kind of have an organic chemistry background, you'll note here when you do this chemistry that this is the cyclization reaction. You can also do an imine condensation of these nitrogens with other quinone moieties. Uh, 
And when you do that, um, that of course does not lead to cyclization, but those can be easily hydrolyzed off with a mild acid treatment. Um, and so what you're left with is these sorts of sites, right? Um, we also looked at this on a high surface area carbon black material using nitrogen K edge X ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy. And what you see here, this is an X ray technique. You come in with a core level excitation of the nitrogen, you see N to pi star and N to sigma star transitions. It gives you a fingerprint of the local environment around these nitrogen sites. And so here in blue is what you see for those nitrogen sites on a uh, high surface area carbon black material. Um, and this is what you get when you compare that to a molecule you can buy from Aldrich. And, and the really good correspondence here um, uh, is illustrative, basically, of eight, the fact that 1890s organic chemistry still applies to these systems um, and that uh, we are able to do very high fidelity surface conjugation chemistry um, in a material that is otherwise relatively poorly defined in terms of its surface chemistry. So um, in our mind, this, this really opens up a world of possibilities. And I'll, I'll walk you through kind of what we've done so far in this context. Um, so the first thing we want to ask is, you know, what are the ways we can characterize these sites on the surface, right? And, and, and it turns out that, that we can do this electrochemically because we lucked out um, in one very important way. So it turns out that these 1,4 nitrogen heterocycles are known to undergo two electron, two proton reduction as molecules to form from these pyrazines the corresponding dihydropyrazines, right? You can see this in a cyclic voltammogram of a soluble molecule with an unfunctionalized electrode. All that data will be shown in red in all the subsequent slides. And what you can see is a wave associated with the two electron. This is again, this is an outer sphere charge transfer to do the proton coupled electron transfer of this pyrazine to the dihydropyrazine, and then the back oxidation of the dihydropyrazine to the corresponding pyrazine in this wave at around zero volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode. Now, if you look at the modified electrode surface that has no molecule in solution here in blue, you see an admittedly broad wave, but a wave that's roughly in a similar position, indicative of the same type of two electron, two proton conversion of this linkage. And unsurprisingly, you see that both of these waves shift in a quasi Nernstian fashion with pH, as you would expect for a, a, a process involving um, uh, explicit electron proton coupling here. Um, and um, so, so what I've shown you so far really is not all that surprising, right? We have the moiety on the surface, it's behaving not all that characteristically different than what it is doing in solution. But the real question we want to ask is, is this site really embedded within the electrochemical double layer? Is this site really experiencing um, the full brunt of the interfacial polarization in the same way that an authentic, say, gold step edge atom site would, right? And, and our first indication that this might be the case is to look at the outer sphere chemistry of these molecules relative to the surface in a medium that does not provide a proton. So um, uh, this was really important to us, right? Because in these cases, we're doing electron and proton transfer, both for the molecule and for the surface site. Or put another way, a charged particle in both cases is transiting across the double layer. If you instead take these molecules and you dissolve them up in a non-aqueous electrolyte, like acetonitrile, let's say protic, instead of this two electron, two proton reduction, you instead see an outer sphere one electron reduction that converts the pyrazine to the corresponding radical anion compound. Now, this is an outer sphere electron transfer. Particle moving across the double layer here is the electron, right? Okay. And what we found here, which, which initially puzzled us, but actually makes quite a bit of sense um, uh, for, for a lot of the data I'll show you, show you later on, is really that these sites uh, display on the electrode uh, nothing different than just background double layer charging behavior. Put another way, there is not a discrete redox process associated with charging this site because this site is effectively embedded within the rest of the band structure of the solid, right? And so the free charging behavior of the rest of the interface is dominating the overall capacity of this. And there's no discrete charging behavior here because they're, they're fundamentally um, uh, electronically coupled to each other, right? And in fact, this voltammogram here is the same one that gave rise to this. So you take it into water, you see this large electron proton transfer wave, you go into an aprotic medium, you don't see any of that. Um, but, you know, my background is as an inorganic chemist. Most people may not um, uh, know that considering all the different things we work on, but um, uh, we synthesized a coordination compound that is really well known to display outer sphere charge transfer behavior to see how far this would extend, right? So this is a ruthenium compound. 
It's a ruthenium polypyridyl compound, it's really well-known chemistry dating back to the early 50s. Um, uh, and and uh, you can do charge transfer to this to convert from a ruthenium-2 formally to a ruthenium-3 oxidation state. That's why we chose this. You can do the exact same conjugation chemistry by introducing some diamines in the periphery. You can verify by a, by a whole bunch of different spectroscopic techniques, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, XPS, that you've retained the fidelity of the ruthenium center on this site. Um, I won't go into all that detail, but if anyone's interested, I can, I can talk about it in greater detail. Reason we chose this is because in a non-aqueous aprotic medium, this molecule undergoes a very clean and relatively facile outer sphere charge transfer, outer sphere electron transfer, to oxidize from the ruthenium-2 to the ruthenium-3 state, and then, and then back reduce on the return scan. And once again, over the solvent window that's available to us, this conjugated site displays nothing under than background double air charging behavior, right? And this is again illustrative of the fact that this site really is not experiencing the interfacial potential drop, or put another way, um, it is buried inside of the electrochemical doubling. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll elaborate this model a bit more after I give you a bit more data, right? So um, we wanted to ask what would happen if we took a metal center that not only underwent charge transfer in terms of electron flow as a molecule, but very importantly that that electron flow was coupled to the rupturing or dissociation of an inner sphere bond, right? So we looked at this compound, it's a rhodium-3 phenanthylene CP star chloride compound. You can do two electron reduction of this from formerly rhodium-3 to rhodium-1, but very importantly for our purposes, it leads also to dissociation of an inner sphere halide, right? And that was what really was interesting to us, to ask whether this inner sphere halide and it crossing the double layer would give rise to an electrochemical response. So the voltammogram of this as a molecule displays the sharp voltammetric features associated with two electron reduction from rhodium-3 to rhodium-1 formally. And if you conduct this electrochemistry in a TBA chloride electrolyte, you can rebind the chloride, reassociate, and do that back oxidation from formally rhodium-1 to rhodium-3. And you get a return wave here. Now on the surface conjugated site with no molecule in solution, you once again see um, very clear as day, if you will, electrosorption wave for the binding, the unbinding of chloride and rebinding of chloride. Um, uh, as one would expect for that process, um, it's indeed dependent on the identity of the halide. If you change it from chloride to bromide, you get a shift. We've actually canvassed a whole bunch of pseudohalides, acetates, thiocyanates, et cetera. They all cause a shift and that can actually be mapped to the relative free energy of binding. Um, uh, if you vary the concentration of the halide, you see a quasi-Nernstein dependence on that, on the potential, as one would expect, for a chloride transfer across uh, to bind to the surface site. And we observe some other things. If you add a neutral L-type ligand like carbon monoxide, you will, in effect, poison the surface. On the first wave, you'll see desorption of this halide. You will then bind CO and you'll see no return halide reabsorption wave. And in every subsequent cycle, you'll simply see the background double air charging uh, behavior of the electrode. And then the last piece of information, which we found really interesting and one of the things you can sort of do most cleanly on these bottom up type of systems is you can integrate this wave and, and check that relative to an independent measurement of the number of rhodiums on the surface. You do that by digesting your electrode and just counting up the number of rhodiums. And this was intriguing to us, at least certainly as coming from a molecular perspective, because this molecule undergoes formal reduction by two electrons. It has what's called an electrochemical potential inversion. The reduction by one electron actually occurs at a more negative potential than the second redox process. And so in an obligate sense, this gets reduced formally by two electrons from rhodium-3 to rhodium-1. But when you look at the surface site, what you find actually is that the integration of this wave is only equal to one electron per rhodium site, right? And so we wanted to understand this in greater detail in terms of what the local valency of the rhodium site is doing. So we turned to X-ray absorption spectroscopy. This was done at Argonne National Labs in collaboration with Jeff Miller. Here's our electrochemical cell. Here's the synchrotron beam coming in here and the, the detector in the back. There's a schematic of what this looks like. What you have essentially is a glassy carbon plate electrode where we've modified only one side of that electrode with the rhodium molecules of interest. And what we're really asking here by the spectroscopy that we detect is how is the rhodium valency changing? Now, again, the power of this, the enormous power of this, uh, of these bottom-up approaches is really illustrated here because we can independently prepare a molecular rhodium-3 standard and a molecular rhodium-1 standard that we know is of identical local structure to the site on the surface. 
And that's the type of power that's really not afforded by many other top-down systems, but it allows us to kind of know and benchmark what we would expect if the local valency of the rhodium center is indeed changing. Um, and we know from those model studies that we expect about an EV and a half shift in the Zane's edge, as well as a change in the Zane's shape. Um, and so I'm not going to show you the molecular data, but I'll show you what happens on the surface, right? So this is, a, now again, this is the modified surface. Here's the rising Zane's edge, which is diagnostic of the oxidation state of the rhodium center. Um, when you look at it at the open circuit potential, which is well below this electrode desorption wave, what you see is a rising edge that is roughly similar, though not identical, to that of a rhodium-3 model compound. If you then polarize a volt negative of that, you see no shift in this wave. And if you go even further than that, you see no shift uh, beyond that as well, indicating to us that this system is essentially maintaining its local valency formally, despite the fact that it is indeed dissociating a halide and reassociating it of this wave. Or, or put another way to recap, what we have is a halide transiting across the double layer, charge loading in from the external circuit, and all the while the valency of the rhodium center is unchanged. Um, and, and one way to view this from the molecular perspective is really to view that indeed, uh, you know, from solid state perspective, this isn't maybe all that surprising, right? In that what we have here now is a vast reservoir of electronic states with which we can load and unload electrons. But very interestingly, that can lead to inner sphere bond rearrangement at the molecular site that we've incorporated suggesting really that these systems are behaving like that sort of um, um, goal that I set up in the beginning of being able to introduce sites that have the properties of inner sphere heterogeneous catalytic behavior and reactivity, even though they have all the trappings and synthetic tunability of a molecular site. So this was very, very exciting to us. And it also has a lot of implications for how one thinks about uh, pseudo-capacitive processes and other um, uh, electrochemical adsorption processes in materials, um, that, that local valency change need not be um, coincident uh, with uh, adsorption processes if there are other states available for electron transfer. Okay, so all the data I've shown you so far, we can put together in terms of a very simple model that I think will be very easy to follow for all the people here who compute um, interfacial structure and double layers quite a bit, um, which is if we start first at the molecular picture where we have a freely diffusing molecule or a molecule tethered to a surface through an insulating bridge, the picture we really draw here is one of an interfacial electric field drop and a mole molecule to a first approximation residing outside of the majority of that interfacial potential drop. Or put another way, these molecules can be viewed of as freely solvated in the solution. And as a result of that, the reason we are observing charge transfer in these uh, cases, or, or the reason we're observing outer sphere charge transfer in these cases, is because as we polarize the electrode, we move its Fermi level. And when we create a discontinuity between the Fermi level here and the states that exist within our molecule, that discontinuity drives electron tunneling across the double layer. And this is why we observe charge flow in an outer sphere sense. When we have these sites that are conjugated to the surface, or when, of course, we have a you know, step edge site on a gold electrode, those active sites are effectively uh, strongly coupled to the rest of the bath of band states in the solid. And indeed, they are um, uh, essentially linked uh, to the surface in a way that puts them inside of the electrochemical double layer. And so as a result of that, when I move the Fermi level of my electrode through interfacial polarization, I'm changing the interfacial field profile and that is simultaneously augmenting the energy levels of the metal center that we've incorporated onto the surface. And as a result of the lack of discontinuity in the energy levels between the two, we don't observe anything other than the double layer charging characteristics of the electrode, irrespective of the incorporation of many sites that ought to be redox active in a traditional outer sphere electron transfer sense. And this same exact picture can be used to describe an inner sphere reaction, right? So when we have, say, an ion binding, just denoted generically as this substrate, when we initiate that inner sphere chemistry via outer sphere charge transfer, we're really moving the Fermi level above, say, a LUMO level of this rhodium center. Electrons load into, say, the DZ squared orbital of this formerly rhodium-3 center, and that dis induces dissociation of the halide. But on the other hand, when we have this site tied to the surface in this conjugated fashion, whether or not we load electrons in the rhodium center and whether or not we dissociate or associate a halide are two fundamentally different questions. And the reason they're fundamentally different questions is, of course, because we have a vast density of electronic states available with which to load and unload electrons in the solid. And as a result of this, what happens when we polarize our electrode is we indeed are moving the DZ square of the rhodium up in energy, 
But because we have a very negatively charged electrode, that negatively charged electrode is able to unsurprisingly repel a negatively charged halide. And when that halide dissociates from the electrode surface, there's a single electron charge that comes in from the external circuit to compensate for that. Or put another way, this is really an electroabsorption reaction. And the fact that there's one halide equivalent of charge that is specifically absorbing is the reason we have one compensating electron. Although I, we can talk about this later, there's no, of course, requirement that the electroabsorption valency be unity in this situation. Um, uh, uh, a subtlety that we can maybe discuss later on. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the, this indicates the electron stoichiometry. This is why if you block the site from reassociating the halide, you no longer see charge transfer. It's also why the local valency of the rhodium center is not changing upon uh, the observation of this electroabsorption process. Right? So all the data I've really shown you can be put together in this very simple model that, that the, where the real takeaway is that these um, molecular sites that we've conjugated to the surface behave as part of the electrode rather than merely being attached to the electrode. And that embedding of them really captures the salient properties of single atom catalysts but carries with it this sort of added uh, bonus, a uh, huge bonus in my mind, of being able to synthesize this from the bottom up with molecular level tunability. And one of the ways we can illustrate the power of this system is by asking, can we understand something about fundamental properties of, of um, interfacial reactivity? And one prototypical example we can look at is proton coupled electron transfer, right? Um, and and uh, so I showed you very early on that these pyrazines, these one, four nitrogen heterocycles on the surface will undergo two electron, two proton reduction to generate these dihydropyrazines. And you get a wave there and around uh, the reversible hydrogen electron. Um, and, and from what I've shown you so far, right, what this should indicate to us is that the site on the surface that is engaging in charge transfer really should only have the capacity to bind and unbind ions that are crossing the double layer. It need not, as a molecule, have any authentic electron transfer redox capacity, right? And one way to illustrate that is by simply appending these sites with a simple carboxylate moiety. Right now, a benzoic acid moiety is not redox active in any normal potential window, right? And, and yet, when we incorporate this carboxylate moiety, we not only see the two electron, two proton reduction associated with the phenazine reduction to dihydrophenazine, we see a second redox wave. It's about one half in magnitude of the first. And we attribute this to the transfer of a proton to the carboxylate and a charge balancing electron to the band structure of a solid. Or put another way, we're doing an H adsorption reaction, but we're doing it at a molecularly precise surface site that we have incorporated onto the electrode surface. It has a well-defined free energy of H adsorption. That free energy of H adsorption is a, a couple hundred millivolts positive of where it is for the two electron, two proton reduction of the nitrogens. Indeed, you can go further, show that not only this is uh, Nernstein independence, um, but that it also will vary as you change the functionality of the group, whether you move it to a hydroxyl or an ammonium site or a carboxylate, you can systematically shift this potential. All of these waves move in a Nernstein fashion, um, uh, but very interestingly, you can actually take this data and chop it up at one pH, right? You can just take a vertical cut through the data at one pH, turns out you can actually do it at any pH and you'll get very similar information because they're all roughly Nernstein. And you can do a plot that really is very, essentially impossible to do by any other method, right? Which is where you take the pKa of a molecular analog of the site that is undergoing the chemistry on the surface and you ask, where is the electron proton redox process or H adsorption process on the surface in potential relative to that molecular pKa? Now, the reason we know this molecular pKa is we just measure it for analogous molecules, right? When you do this, you find quite a remarkable correlation, right? That there's actually a 60 millivolt scaling between the potential of the H adsorption wave and the pKa of the molecular analog. And, and from this, you can also compute a bond dissociation free energy for those of you who kind of have computed this all day long, you'll know that if you take a molecule and you look at the OH bond association free energy of say a benzoic acid unit, that value is around 112 kcals per mole. Um, this, by virtue of conjugating to the surface, we've lowered that effective BDFE to the range of around 60, right? And that's because we've, we're loading the electron into the band structure of the solid, we're loading the proton into this molecular site, right? 
Um, but this correspondence is really cool, and you can actually understand this by just analyzing the fact that anytime you have an electron and a proton transferring, you can decompose that free energy into the free energies of the proton transfer step and that of the electron transfer step. Now in molecules, when you change these substitution patterns, you are not only changing the free energy of proton transfer, you're also changing the free energy of electron transfer because you're usually augmenting the energies of the homo and lumo. In this situation, as we walk across all of these moieties, we are not changing the free energy of the electron because that's still residing largely in the frontier orbital levels of the band structure of the solid. And that's why we get this linear correlation that's only correlated to effectively the pK of the molecular analog. In fact, you can write this from first principles, just analyzing this as an electroabsorption process with a proton transiting the double layer. And by just matching the chemical potentials, electrochemical potentials of both sides, you can actually write a very simple analytical expression, which is that all of these H adsorption or PCT waves just give you a 60 millivolt dependence on the delta between the pKa of the molecule and the pH with an augmenting term, which is really just the energy of the electrons in the carbon. And you can actually use the data to back out this value, right? So if you ask, where does the pK equal the pH? You know that because you know the molecular analogs. You can draw a horizontal line where that exists and back out this energy of electron transfer to the solid. And unsurprisingly, you actually back out a value that's within about 100 millivolts of the independently measured work function of carbon. So this is really telling us that the system is really behaving as this true hybrid of molecular local bonding properties and band structure properties of the solid. And it really accrues from the fact that electrons are loading into that delocalized state and protons are binding to the site that's on the surface, right? Um, but this to us is really illustrative of the power of these systems and how, why they should really be viewed as, as, as heterogeneous systems that are engaging in sort of intersphere reactivity in the sense of any other metallic oxide or, 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 or metallic surface. I want to spend the last little bit of time that I have explaining some of the consequences for catalytic reactivity. We've studied quite a number of catalytic reactions on these systems, um, um, all of which see promotion basically in catalysis relative to molecular analogs of this. Um, we're still trying to sort that out in many systems, but I want to illustrate at a foundational level what we're really learning here, right? So let's just go back to the original picture of how electrocatalysis occurs on molecules and the mode of catalysis is via redox mediation. Put another way, molecule comes near the surface, electron tunnels to that molecule, essentially loads up an electron, say for a reductive process in the LUMO level of that molecule via outer sphere electron transfer, and then that reduced form of the molecule interacts with a substrate to form a bond, say a metal hydride or metal CO2 adduct, and then subsequent electron transfers and proton transfers can generate your product, right? By virtue of this mediated scheme, you can write a reaction coordinate diagram that looks like this, where you have the metal, the electron, and the solid in your substrate and solution, the metal center meaning this coordination compound I'm referring to, Upon reduction of that molecular site, you get to a reduced anion, and then you have some barrier height for actually activating your substrate. Very importantly though, right, when I'm changing the applied potential to my electrode, what I'm really doing is changing the energy of the electron to solid. And as a result of that, because the molecule is not interacting strongly electronically with the surface, all I'm doing when I'm doing that is changing the ratioing of the metal in the reduced versus oxidized form. That's of course changing the population of the reduced metal center, but it's not altering the free energy profile of the substrate activation step, right? And this is categorically different than what we observe when we're doing authentic sort of inner sphere catalytic reactivity on a metal surface, right? Because here we have adiabatic electron transfer coincident with a substrate binding event in most situations. And as a result of that, when we're changing the applied potential, we have a single barrier height. We're actually changing the free energy profile for that by virtue of the interfacial electric field through which the molecule that is being activated, activated is transiting. So if our molecular sites that we're incorporating by conjugation are trying to display this reactivity, there ought to be a way for us to prove that. And we found a system that actually does illustrate that quite well. So we looked again at this rhodium CP star phenanthrolene compound. We, we dangled some sulfonates on the back of it in order to make it water soluble. And we looked at this molecule as a hydrogen evolution catalyst in aqueous electrolyte. So first starting off, I'm gonna show data in red for the discrete soluble molecule. And you find that you get a catalytic wave. This is by no means a great catalyst. This is not our purpose to try to make a great catalyst. Um, uh, and, but in any case, this is a, a catalyst for hydrogen evolution under low pH environments. 
If instead you move to intermediate pH, say pH 7, what you find is that you no longer get this catalytic wave. Um, uh, at comparable overpotentials, you don't see a catalytic wave. Instead, you see a quasi-reversible rhodium-3, rhodium-1 formal reduction process. And if you go to pH 13, you see that that quasi-reversible wave actually grows in intensity, but you once again at a comparable overpotential do not see um, a catalytic wave, right? And you can understand why this is by understanding the notion of redox mediation, right? So what is happening here is you are doing outer sphere electron transfer to formally reduce the rhodium-3 to rhodium-1. And then that rhodium-1 has a defined, molecularly defined, if you will, basicity. If you're in the presence of a very strong proton donor like hydronium or, or other buffer proton donors at, at lower pH environments, you have a strong enough acidity to actually protonate that rhodium site and or the CP star and ultimately make hydrogen by that pathway. Um, but of course, if you back off on the strength of the proton donor and you go into alkaline media, you don't have that strength anymore. And unsurprising that that rhodium-1 compound is simply not reducing enough, simply not basic enough to bind that weak proton from proton donor like water. And so it simply stares at you and you see a quasi-reversible process, but it does not mediate hydrogen catalysis. You can actually plot this on a poor bay diagram. So I'm just showing here the Nernstein line for hydrogen, protons to hydrogen. And, and here's where the rhodium-3-1 redox potential is moving. Now, the basicity of this site is constant across this pH range. The reason there's a slight shift is because this hydroxide can exchange with water in this lig ligation site here. Um, but nonetheless, because of this defined basicity of the rhodium-1 compound, you actually only get catalytic activity in this red region when you're at very, very low pHs. And the reason for that, of course, is that you need to have a proton donor strong enough to be able to protonate this rhodium-1 site that you generate. But this type of catalytic behavior is completely different than what we see for uh, the conjugated rhodium site. So in black is simply the background behavior without the rhodium metal center there, just with the ligand. And in blue is actually the, the rhodium center on the surface. And we see catalytic activity turn on. We see it not only active at pH 1, but also at pH 7 at comparable over potentials and also at pH 13 at comparable and you can actually plot the onset potential of catalysis and you see a quasi Nernstein scaling of that hydrogen evolution line relative to the overall um, hydrogen evolution curve. And I should say at the outset, the question of proton donor in this situation, we have ample buffers in all of these cases um, to be able to supply proton donors to these sites. And, uh, but we could talk in great length about what this means about um, um, uh, the, the rates of H delivery to these molecularly precise sites as a function of pH. And if you really squint at this, you can actually see here that the overpotentials are indeed higher in alkaline media than they are in acid. Uh, something that's been well recognized in, in platinum electrochemistry and has been you know, also studied computationally and theoretically to a great extent. Um, but we see that also in this molecular system and, and maybe an interesting uh, concept for additional theoretical investigation. But we've studied the system and actually seen that the kinetics are really very analogous to what you see for say a metallic gold electrode. You essentially have Volmer limited hydrogen evolution catalysis on the system. You see a kinetic isotope effect when you change the deuterium, you see the tackle behavior you usually expect for a, Vol uh, for a Volmer reaction. So what's really happening here is that there's obligate concerted electron proton transfer in this reaction as you would expect for H adsorption at any surface site. That we putatively invoke is bind to the rhodium and then ultimately the second step, probably a Horowski type step because we don't really have available easily a Tafel type of reaction here, um, is what happens to ultimately generate hydrogen. Now, the power of the system, right, is we can go in and systematically tune this site. We can put a methyl right here. We can change the composition of the CP star. We can put um, proton donor auxiliaries here. Those are all studies that are underway, but it allows us this sort of power to be able to construct the site at a three-dimensional level um, with a very, very high degree of fidelity, um, uh, which I think will teach us a lot about how single atom active sites can actually behave. So with that, I'm just going to conclude by saying that I've shown you some very, very simple surface conjugation chemistry that borrows from 1890s organic chemistry on the surfaces of carbon materials. And that it appears that the electronic coupling across these pyrazine bridges is sufficient to be able to essentially embed these sites within the electrochemical double layer and make them behave essentially like authentic metallic surface sites in, in much the way that any top-down synthesis of a single atom catalyst would generate.
Um, and um, uh, I've sh I didn't show you this, but, but we've also studied this in the context of CO2 reduction catalysis in non-aqueous electrolytes, and we see um, a kinetic scaling uh, akin to that of a metallic surface. And, and I showed you that in the context of hydrogen evolution catalysis, we are no longer pinned by the redox levels of the molecule, but are able to actually augment the free energy profile for H adsorption by virtue of the interfacial field that the molecule on the surface experiences. Um, so with that, I just want to thank the great group of people that did this. One of the real leaders in this area in my group since the very beginning is uh, Megan Jackson. Uh, she predicted a lot of the weird observations that we observed before we observed them. She's now doing her postdoc at UC Berkeley and is going to be a great catch on the job market in the coming year uh, or, or the year after. Um, many others contribute to this project. Others have made porphyrin platforms that are on the surface, like Cori, uh, that model many N-doped active sites. Um, others have worked on making these pyridinic compounds, like Travis in the back here, um, and we're working on conjugating those systems to surfaces. Uh, but ultimately, the synthetic power of these systems, uh, I think, I've shown you has enormous opportunities for uh, trying to create surface sites that have um, both fidelity and tunability and the ability to uh, construct them with a high degree of precision. So with that, I'd, I'd love to take some questions and um, uh, particularly maybe engage a conversation on how theory can play a strong role in um, uh, helping us develop these systems more. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Yogi, for your very comprehensive talk. Um, and uh, I'm just looking at the chat window. So if, if participants have questions, you can either post it on the chat window or you can also um, type X and then maybe we can unmute uh, you. Uh, okay, so we have our first question uh, from Max Huesley. Um, and he says, great talk and magnific magnificent uh, fundamental work. Uh, since the structure of the catalyst active sites may be different beyond the uh, pyrazine mighty, uh, I'm wondering if you've found a way to analyze or even quantify the uh, uniformity or homogeneity of, these, of those molecularly defined single atom catalysts. Yeah, excellent question, right? So, so this has actually taught us a lot about how to think about catalysis, at least I can say from my own kind of um, perspectives. Um, and, and the reason it has is that, that you know, we, we thought really that the, the non-local environment would make a huge uh, difference. And in certain cases, when, for example, the site of proton binding for, say, the pyrazine wave is very close to the, that peripheral environment, we do see pretty substantial broadening in those waves. Um, but I would say even in those cases, we're talking broadening maybe on the order of, a, you know, a, a full width at half maxes. In certain cases, we see um, somewhere between, say, 100 and 200 millivolts, right? Now, the ideal is 90 millivolts for a sort of Nernsteinly defined adsorption wave on a surface, right? Um, and so while there is heterogeneity um, in these, we found that if you protect the active site, and we found this even more so the case when you have a metal center there, um, uh, you, you can actually create local environments that behave reasonably homogeneous despite the sort of non-local um, heterogeneity that we know must exist on the surface. So um, while there is some, uh, we found that it's not nearly as large as we would have predicted. And, and that to us is, is um, uh, interesting and, and perhaps to us speaks a lot to how to think about all heterogeneous catalysis in much more of a sort of molecular local picture, um, at least in terms of the bonding manifold. The electronic structure, of course, is hugely dependent on, on the, the non-local properties, the potential of zero free charge, et cetera, uh, that are defined by the aggregate um, electronic structure of the solid. But in terms of where the bond is, the bond is pretty local, and, and so its sensitivity to what's around it ends up dropping off pretty quickly. That, that's what we've generally found. Okay. Um, there's. Let's see. Someone's raising their hand. Yeah, maybe feel free. I, I can't see the chat, so just feel free to just just speak speak up. I guess also that's fine too. Yes. Oh, okay. So there's a question by Muhammad Rai, and he asks. Uh, can catalysts be inhibitors? Uh, for example, inhibitor for low carbon steel corrosion. Hmm, excellent question. Um, I, so, so yeah, that's, well, let, let me say that in a couple of ways, right? So, so the ability to kind of control at an atomistic level what's on the surface uh, gives us a lot of opportunities to ask questions about surface interfacial processes that go beyond catalysis. Uh, we've, we've only really 
sort of scratch the tip of the iceberg in this domain. Um, but it is really intriguing to ask, can you, for example, have a surface site that predisposes you to nucleating a given phase of a material? That would be in the context of depositing a material. But perhaps analogously, one can ask whether a given surface site can inhibit um, uh, some other reaction on the surface, either by creating a countervailing site for binding a given species um, or, or inhibiting, um, uh, but it, it, it's, it's stuff that we've only begun to really think about um, uh, in great detail and try to put in place in great detail. Uh, but uh, we, we're very excited to kind of use this as a platform to understand charge transfer reactions writ large, uh, whether it be in anions, cations of relevance to a wide array of materials. I mean, whether any of these exact systems will necessarily uh, get to the level of stability, et cetera, that will land in an actual practical device, I have no idea, of course. Um, but what I do know is that it, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, toolbox for being able to really understand a lot of fundamentals about how interfaces behave. Uh, okay, so the next question is by Ricardo Alonso Martinez. And he asks, uh, how, how do you compare um, single atom catalysts to, uh, to enzymes in, in nature? Yeah, excellent question. So um, I think to a large extent, nature also exploits expanded electronic density of states. Um, many of the best catalysts in nature, uh, at least for complex multi-electron transfer reactions, tend to either have active sites already embedded within clusters um, or uh, very closely co-localized with clusters that feed and unfeed electrons. And, and uh, I, I think it, um, it's been studied to some extent, of course, theoretically by, by people in this audience, um, as well as um, others. But uh, generally speaking, the amount of electronic interaction across those clusters is quite large, right? Um, and they're you know, very complex spin manifolds that are also baked into that electronic structure. And, and so I think that active sites in enzymes also have exploited when they need to, um, the uh, ability to couple an active site through uh, a more delocalized manifold of states that will serve to lower the barrier for uh, binding substrates and activating them. And at some level, that's really what we're doing here, right? We're taking a molecular site that has a sort of paucity of states and then tying it in with uh, a band structure that provides excess available states. So I, I kind of in the molecular community think of this as redox non-innocent uh, ligands that are solids attached to molecules. That's another way of viewing it. And in, in that vernacular in an enzyme, the same phenomenon is, is to a large extent at play that the active site is embedded within a host that gives a large degree of redox capacity uh, for buffering valence change in the metal center and exposing uh, lower barrier reactivity. So sort of a long-winded answer, but, but I think that there are similarities in their behavior. Great. Uh, yeah, so now we have a bunch of questions. Let me see if there's, um, okay. Uh, there's a question by someone from DTU, uh, which is, um, do you think we are limited by the number of active sites on such hybrid systems? Because uh, they- yeah, great. yeah, Yeah, great question. So, so what we do actually to control site density is we can, uh, we actually pre-oxidize the carbon surfaces. Um, and so I can give you some numbers, right? You know, so, so um, uh, when we, I mean, maybe this is the most useful number to some extent, is if we take a high surface area carbon black material and we were to incorporate these sites with a metal center, we can get sort of metal weight percent loadings on the order of, um, you know, fractional 0.5 to 1% um, in, in certain cases. And, and so um, we may be limited for certain situations in terms of the active site loading, but that in my mind is, is offers a real opportunity for materials design um, in terms of constructing materials where these uh, have a higher population of these quinone sites or a more regular arrangement of them uh, while still presenting the band structure. But I would say even at the outset, working with just carbon black materials, uh, if your site is really, really active and doing chemistry with very, very high selectivity and is able to um, uh, by virtue of its local structure, uh, overcome uh, certain key barriers in the reaction, I, I think that th this sort of loading can still, still get you to, to quite, uh, quite high uh, activities overall, but still sort of remains to be seen in terms of how uh, we can deploy this in a systematic way across a wide array of reactions. Okay, so uh, the next question is by Siddharth Deshpande, uh, and the question's a bit long. So uh, 
in the case of molecular catalysts, uh, reactivity or activity is, uh, can be linked to the oxidation state of the metal center, and the oxidation state can be changed as a function of the uh, applied potential. Is it possible to independently affect the oxidation or the electronic state of the metal center in these conjugated catalysts, uh, where now it is combined to a conductor framework and its electronic state is coupled uh, to the band structure of the framework? As in, are there ways to vary the redox potentials of the metal center with respect to the Fermi level to which it is pinned? Yeah. Excellent question, right? And, and that's all through local control of the environment, right? So, so, so the, 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 the local environment, say like, for example, the substitution pattern on the financial ligand, or if it was a conjugated porphyrin in the ancillary environment, our expectation is that those local environmental changes will have a pronounced effect on the frontier local projected density of states of the metal center against the band structure of the solid. And so the hypothesis that we're sort of actively testing is whether we can manipulate those sites to be able to move a given level in the metal center, local isolate metal center at a different level relative to the band structure. Of course, this is extraordinarily difficult to do when you're doing top-down synthesis, but it would be awesome to be able to create metal centers with a local environment houses an arbitrarily varying degree of local valency and local frontier orbital level relative to the band structure, right? Because then the absorption process is given and not only by the change in the local frontier orbital level in terms of that driving the affinity for a given intermediate, but also the energy of the electrons in the solid by independently playing on those two. Uh, we feel you ought to be able to walk adsorption-free energies in a very systematic way and, and also ask an even more salient question, which is, uh, how does the frontier orbital level and the degree of interaction of that with the frontier states in the solid impact on the relative rates of an elementary charge transfer reaction in the interface. Um, again, a question that's pretty hard to tackle by any other method, but we think we can get there uh, to be able to understand that. But it has to do with local control of the environment relative, and, and, and put in, I could elaborate on that a little bit more, is one can also think about pre-doping the solid, moving the Fermi level of the solid, for example, or its uh, uh, density of states, and keeping the metal center the same, or augmenting the local structure of the metal center, um, and, and, and keeping the band structure of the solid same. So those, both of those independent handles, I think, are, are very much sort of a frontier area for exploration for us. Okay, great. Um, the next question is by Sudarshan Vijay. Um, do you expect any dependence of the support uh, uh, in terms of the charge transfer behavior or the CVs? Uh, um, that is, so, the question is, do you expect any dependence of the support? That is, where the moiety is bound on the CVs or on the charge transfer behavior? So um, I would say that the, the, the I, maybe I'm not fully understanding the question. I mean, the support basically provides for us. The, I don't think of it as a support because they're sort of intimately connected. But the, um, the, the, maybe, maybe the question is asking sort of where on the support it's binding. and, and probably where it is in terms of its non-local structure probably impacts on the degree of uh, broadness in a given redox process we observe. Um, but I do think that the electronic structure of the support, to the extent it can be augmented systematically, will also toggle where adsorption-free energies reside, and, and uh, that could be a systematic way for us to control that. Hmm. I hope that answered the question, although I'm not sure I fully understood it exactly. Uh, so, okay, uh, the next question uh, is from uh, Kiran, uh, and the question is, is there any effect of loading uh, of the molecular catalysts on uh, voltammetric behavior? Can crosstalk between grafted molecules or va varied orientation of the molecules have any effect on charge transfer? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we looked at it a little bit um, by diluting, for example, the molecules, say, with a metal center with other sites where we conjugate just a, a parent phenazine unit, right, that can't then have the metal center attached to it. Um, to the extent that we've looked at that, we have not seen huge changes, you know, maybe on the order of sort of tens of millivolts, but not huge changes in that. So, I, and, and I, maybe I can show, I, I don't have the slides here, but um, uh, we've, we've taken some um, TEM data, average stretch TEM data, that sort of shows the speckling of these sites when you have high contrast to a metal center on the surface. And, and, and there are probably a few sites where there is some um, fairly close proximity of these sites, um, but I would say that's in the minority. And to a first approximation, everything we suggest seems to suggest that they're behaving more or less as roughly site isolated. 
Uh, so we haven't seen huge evidence of the loading really impacting on uh, the behavior. Uh, that's what I would say right now. But we haven't looked at it in, 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 a, in a very concrete way across a wide range of different loadings. With something we're still on the list of things to do. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can ask some very general questions. So the idea that proton electron um, transfer rates or onsets scale with pKa, do you think this is a general concept that's like beyond the system that you're looking at? Because that would be really interesting. Yeah, so maybe I can go back to that slide. I, I actually think that what we've sort of come up with in this model is general to all proton coupled electron transfer yeah. reactions, period. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so maybe I can, because actually the way we derive this expression comes from pure just first principles analysis. In fact, you could derive this expression without having known anything really about the nature of the site. The problem, of course, is that it's just that on most materials, getting an independent measurement of the pKa to prove that this is what's happening is, 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 is just essentially impossible, right? Because there's no way to pull out that site and go and measure its molecular level pKa. Um, uh, but, but since we've been able to do that here, the fact that we observe this correlation suggests to us that this is, that, that pretty much every interfacial PCT reaction can be decomposed into an effective, I would say, free energy of electron transfer at the Fermi level and a corresponding pKa of that site. I, I do think that that, yeah. that can be done. Um, uh, and in certain cases, that can be extraordinarily instru instructive, I think. Um, uh, yeah, about that's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because then in that case, then maybe we don't have to calculate anything with, with this kind of relationship. <laughs> so that's great. Um, and also, I guess if we don't have any other questions, then I can, I can ask a few more. Um, so how much control do you think you have to synthesize whatever one can dream of? Because I guess the reason I'm asking is because at least theoretically, we would expect that the activity of single atom catalysts to really depend on its environment in terms of what types of P block elements. And if we could dream of something, do you have control over, like complete control over what can be synthesized? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, given enough people hours, yes, we have okay. arbitrary control, right? <laughs> the, the, um, I, I mean, I think the thing I would say, right, and this is also why it's great talking to, 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 to theorists in this case, is, is I, I feel that, um, and, and you know, I would love to entertain a discussion to anyone who would wanna, wanna chat about this, right, is um, um, we have a lot of sense of what is, I would say, uh, synthetically practical on the months to months time scale versus what's synthetically what? tractable on the years time scale and pretty much anything is possible right i mean that's kind of the it's it's on the one hand both the huge enormous opportunity and also the sort of curse to some extent is is that um anything is po the, the entire world of molecular inorganic chemistry is possible um, provided that we can append appropriately a diamine on it now in certain cases for a really complicated structure that can be synthetically challenging. It took us about a year and a half or so to work out a really good synthesis for conjugating a metalloporphyrin. But now that we have that, we can use that platform quite systematically to look at all the metalloporphyrin conjugates in the periodic table to a first approximation, right? And there are synthetic hurdles along the way and so forth. So it's not, it's not like we can snap our fingers and kind of make any material. But what I think is really powerful is that these systems, um, you know, could be a really powerful opportunity to do inverse design in a really meaningful way. Um, because if a target were to be identified that um, you know, should display a given property, it, it, would, it would allow us to deploy more um, synthetic people power uh, towards that effort. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's what I would say, right? Um, uh, and, and yes, I think that the, 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 the palette of possibilities is, is uh, as far as the eye can see, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I think we have a few more questions. I, I don't know about the time. So, so yeah, I have a, I have a question myself, which is, um, so let's say you want to do CO2, CO2 reduction on single atom catalysts. And uh, so with regards to pKa, can you also like measure the pKa of an adsorbate like COOH? Because uh, that can then tell you, depending on what pH you are, uh, the, given the pKa of COOH, whether it would be uh, proton, like COOH neutral species or COOH like anionic species, depending on what pH they're operating at? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so uh, 
we are, so, so, so the, the, the power of kind of what I'm showing on this slide, right, is that we're able to take sites and um, essentially measure their equilibrium thermal chemistry mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of voltammograms, and, and that way we can get out very, very cleanly to a high degree of precision that the thermal chemistry of each of these um, H adsorption or PCET processes, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, um, the, the, in a case where you are trying to sample the PKA or thermochemical correlates of a fleeting intermediate, that's a bit more challenging on, I would say, an actual system that is able to carry out the overall catalytic chemistry for a simple reason that, that, that it's hard to sample that equilibrium thermal chemistry before it propagates onto product. Mm -hmm. Now, things we've done some of, right, is, is or, or we can do some of, right, is try to create a, a different molecular structure of that site that can, for example, bind a close analogy to what our intermediate is presumed to be and then measure its equilibrium thermal chemistry um, and, and, and infer from that what we might expect for a given other site. So it's a synthetic challenge ultimately at the end of the day, but um, it is in principle a tractable one. But, but what I should say, which I find pretty, I would say somewhat surprising and intriguing in our mind, right, is that um, if you look at this plot actually here where I'm doing drawing this line, um, we're taking the pKa of the molecular analog now, the molecular analogs pKa is measured in free solution, right? It's just a molecule floating on solution. We, use, we just measure the pKa, right? One can ask, why in the world does the pKa of the molecular analog have to match the pKa at zero field or the potential of zero free charge for that same site on the surface, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, especially because the solvent environment on the surface may be different, maybe more ordered, et cetera, right? And, and, and I think the reason this works to first approximation is that for these sites, you know, water's pretty well solvating. And then the other thing is that even if there were a systematic shift, we'd have to invoke that it's a systematic shift for every single one of these, right? Because we can't have a systematic shift positive in one way, negative for another, because then the correlation would fall apart. Mm -hmm. So this at least suggests to us that in water, the sort of molecular intuition about the pKa of a given site at least at zero field is reasonably accurate in terms of predicting what that PK would be for the surface site, um, which was again, not something we would have thought going into this, but um, I, I think is reasonably true. Um, maybe not for all materials, but for at least site isolated materials, I, I think is perhaps reasonably true. Great, thanks. Uh, so the, we have another question by Marco Melanda. Uh, the question is, would it be possible to synthesize structures where the degree of electron transfer uh, non-adiabaticity or adiabaticity could be changed in a systematic manner. Yeah, excellent question. So, so as, as, as many of you know, right, you know, so there's a, there's a long history of sort of molecular dyads and asking whether their degree of coupling to each other falls within the Robin Day classification system, right? So there's class one, class two, and class three forms of mixed valency, which is essentially the molecular analog of asking if I have two sites, to what extent should I think of them as a single, uh, a single potential well or really a barrier height, in a, you know, a, a barrier height in between in terms of the coupling. Um, and, and so uh, we've looked at that to some extent at the extrema, and I can give you some examples, right? I don't have the slides right here, but um, if you, for example, take this carboxylate, where we're doing this strongly coupled proton transfer and electron transfer to the solid, um, if I insert one methylene space or one um, saturated sp3 carbon between the site of the COOH and the site of the benzene ring, I will extinguish the, this wave. It'll go away essentially, right? Um, and and so, so that tells us that there's a very high degree of sensitivity, at least at the extrema, of sort of going from breaking conjugation to having conjugation. That certainly is something we've seen quite a bit of. What we're just now starting to look at is intermediate cases. For example, say I have a biphenyl unit where there's a tilt angle between the two. In that type of a situation, you have some degree of electronic overlap, but it's of course dependent on the degree of tilt angle and can be augmented in some systematic way depending upon the molecular structure. And in those systems, we are able to see, and we're starting to kind of study this, is, is when do you turn on this sort of coupled limit and when do you turn on the sort of classical outer sphere limit? And when do you walk between those two regimes? Um, and so it's, it's studies we're gonna pull apart through sort of systematic studies of, of the molecular sites and the degree of linkage, but it's a story that's still very much, very much ongoing in our group. And I think it's a fascinating question, actually, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two, two more questions. So um, the next question is by uh, someone from DTU. So have you worked on any other hybrid system, uh, so apart from 
uh, like molecules on graphene materials and thiols on on gold like metals yeah so <laughs> it's funny you ask that right so we actually started so th this was this was an idea this grand idea of melding molecular and heterogeneous catalysis is actually something i proposed back when i was applying for jobs now you know, about, about 7 years ago right and we we actually started in my group trying to look at this problem in the context of, of thiols on gold, right? We were like, okay, let's take a, a well-known sort of surface functionalization chemistry. But as I kind of alluded to in my earlier slides, um, it, it, we found in general, and this is actually pretty much consistent with what a lot of other people have seen, that the thiol gold linkage really does not afford this type of behavior, at least not to a first approximation in most systems. For example, you take a benzene thiol, um, thiolate on a gold surface with a carboxylate at the end, you almost get no electric field modulation in that proton transfer process. But to put it another way, those sites that you dangle off of a thiol gold bond, I think to a first approximation, except in a few limiting cases, are, are to be viewed really as, as molecules that are existing largely outside of the double layer and are pretty, pretty weakly, at least in this context, um, um, coupled uh, to the surface. So, so we, we didn't find that system to really be one that gave rise to this behavior. And um, that's not to say though, that, that one couldn't kind of elaborate on that in a way that would give rise to this behavior by other linkage motifs. And, and a big area of our future studies are to figure out how general is this phenomenon across other surface molecule um, connection points, right? Um, uh, does, does this connection require a conjugate pyrazine or, or can it also exist in certain limits um, on other materials and through other connections? And so, so it's something we're still studying, but at least our initial studies of the gold thiol system found that that, that was not really one that displayed this behavior for, for, for reasons I guess we don't uh, fully understand, but probably as a result of the fact that there's a large uh, potential drop right at the gold thiol bond. That's my, my, my uh, very naive sort of initial hypothesis on that. Great, okay. I, I think there's uh, the, the final question, which is, um, can you comment on the scale, uh, stability and scalability of GCCs? Uh, do they adopt the stability of the conjugated uh, molecule? Um, yeah, great question. Um, uh, so like anything, right, stability is, is, is very context dependent. What I mean by that, I guess, is, you know, we, we have measured some, for example, metalloporphins doing CO2 reduction that, um, you know, are stable. We haven't done, you know, exhaustive studies to the point of days, but stable over, you know, many, many, many hours, uh, for example, uh, with uh, retained sort of Faradaic efficiencies, for example, over time. Uh, and, and those are roughly to a first approximation of comparable stability to single atom catalysts that are made by top-down methods. Uh, that being said, of course, you know, there are environments where these materials will not be very stable, shouldn't really be expected to be very stable if you're very oxidative, for example, right? Um, I, and you generate a lot of reactive oxygen species, hydroxyl radicals, et cetera. Um, you can very easily do uh, reactivity that ruptures uh, either the linkage or the metal or the metal site, and, and and to some extent that would be the case even for for top down synthesis methods of metal and dope carbon. So I would say that um, uh, we're still trying to probe kind of systematically where there are breakpoints and um, where there are stability uh, issues, but it, it's just something we haven't had the bandwidth to fully fully cover. One thing I I would say I find interesting and exciting is that. Because we have a very well-defined site, we can go in and ask very precise structure function correlations as to what leads to stability um, in terms of what the nature of the metal site is or what the nature of the ligand binding environment is or what the nature of the linkage chemistry is. And that, that I think, um, is, a, is a power that, that, that is sort of uniquely offered by the system. So. Okay, so... So I think our, our time is up, but that was super interesting for us, Yogi, and, and I've never seen this before, so it was really good that um, you showed this. Um, but I guess broadly, we're, we're really interested in like kind of a fundamental mechanistic understanding of these systems, again, from a molecular to an extended level. And um, it's always good to have so much control because I've never seen that, and it's always really hard to tie theory and experiment. And so if if ever there's like opportunity for us to discuss um, 
There's always opportunity, Karen. Yeah. So I was, I was, I, when I was thinking about giving this talk, the main reason I wanted to talk about this is because yeah. I think it's such an area that's ripe for, for theory and, and um, uh, you know, in many contexts. Uh, not only kind of understanding the fundamental physics, but also uh, looking at inverse design questions and, and targeting it. Um, uh, we've already worked with a few theorists. So I, I, I can say that um, Sher Sharon Hammer Schiffer's group has, um, is, is just in the latter stages of an initial story looking at um, this proton coupled system. And, and kind of doing some, um, some plane wave calculations of those, but the sky is the limit in terms of what we can study it. And so, yeah, I mean, just ping me. We can, we can totally chat and, and see whether there's some opportunities. Uh, we'd love to, love to work with you guys. Okay, great. So thank you again. That was a wonderful talk. So Yeah, thanks. Well, yeah. thanks everyone. It's great seeing, seeing, seeing all of you. I, I wish I could be in Denmark right now, but uh, uh, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. The staff will be up. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.